Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkies listeners. Thank you again for helping us to reach 100,000 downloads before January 1st, 2022. If you haven't yet seen our thank you video, be sure to check it out in the Facebook groups, Sugar Free for Life, I'm Sweet Enough, and Sugar Bomb in Your Brain. Vera's posted the links there. Okay, we have a surprise for you. Last week, we talked to Dr. Kim Dennis, and it turns out we just couldn't get enough. We had too many questions, and we just enjoyed our time with her. So we asked her back for a second episode. So today... We sit down with her again and we talk about medications that have been and can be used to treat food addiction, what's available, how it works, what to watch out for. We talked about the pros and cons of asking providers for medication interventions, how clients can have the conversation with their medical providers, and that professionals need to be working together on this issue. We talk about bariatric surgery interventions, that there is hope for remission and a solution to this disease. We asked if food addiction will ever be recognized. Will the eating disorder world ever acknowledge that food addiction is real? And is food addiction an appropriate term? We find out what research Dr. Kim believes is still needed for food addiction to be recognized, how to address the spiritual aspect of treatment for this disease. We even get to talk to her about body image work. All right. Welcome back, Dr. Kim. Thank you again for coming back, Dr. Kim. We've had several listeners reach out very recently and ask us to have a discussion about medications and food addiction. What medications are typically used in treating food addictions or symptoms of food addiction, like binge eating or something of the like? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, for sure. So as you know, there aren't randomized, double-blind, controlled studies looking at pharmacotherapy in food addiction in part because half of the world doesn't quite believe that it's actually a clinical entity. So it's hard to do a drug trial with something that's not fully accepted by the medical community or the psychiatric community or the eating disorder world. So largely, we're treating people with medications that hit the co-occurring disorders, right? So we know that people with food addiction oftentimes, for example, have their own histories of substance use disorders. We know that people with food addiction oftentimes have comorbid major depressive disorder, comorbid post-traumatic stress disorder, or early experiences of trauma. Childhood trauma has been shown to be related to food addiction. So a lot of times what we're using are medications that treat those co-occurring disorders we, you know, the FDA approved Vyvanse for binge eating disorder. So that's a medication that is used in binge eating disorder. I take caution with using it for food addiction because if somebody has binge eating disorder and no food addiction, that's a different clinical entity than somebody with binge eating disorder and food addiction. And that's a different clinical entity than somebody with no eating disorder and food addiction. So it becomes quite complex. And in order to help people, I think it's really important as a field and as a doctor that I've done my due diligence in diagnosing what that person has and what that person doesn't have. So binge eating disorder without food addiction you know, Vyvanse can be quite helpful. Even in that scenario, you know, so much of the time in the eating disorder world, our goal with helping people who have eating disorders, including binge eating disorder, is to get them back in touch with natural hunger fullness cues and medications like Vyvanse, which is a stimulant, which has abuse potential, can interfere with somebody getting back in touch with natural hunger fullness cues, you know. So, I do not use that very much at all, even for binge eating disorder. 
So in a person with food addiction, it's not a medication that I would recommend or that I use in my patients with food addiction, simply because we know that the reward pathway, the frontal striatal paths, and also the bottom up from the nucleus accumbens, that reward center up to the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, we know that that center can be activated by medications that are stimulants. You know, and even though Vyvanse is a longer acting stimulant, which means it has lower potential for triggering that reward pathway, it still is there in a way that's different than, say, Prozac or Lexapro. So when it comes to food addiction and the eating behaviors, you know, I think, again, with binge eating associated with binge eating disorder or bulimia, there have been studies that show higher dose naltrexone to be helpful. That's a medication that I use. We always want to watch a person's liver enzymes because naltrexone in higher doses, even in the regular 50 milligram dose that we use for typically for alcohol use disorder, it can cause issues with liver enzymes. But when we use it for you know, the studies that have looked at it for binge eating disorder and bulimia really look at high, much higher doses, 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams a day. So there's that need to be assessing liver enzymes uh, pretty regularly if you're using it in that dose. And I've also found that reward sensitivity is very high in many of the patients that I treat with food addiction and early histories of trauma. And one of the things that I've had to do that I've just learned in, in my clinical work with patients who have this is to, we're starting at very, very low doses of naltrexone because they oftentimes have pretty intense nausea if you try to start at 25 milligrams or 50 milligrams right off the bat. So most of the people that I'm treating have that high sensitivity to reward, to medications that impact the reward system and the reward circuitry. But I think the only tool that we really have at this point in our toolbox medication wise for food addiction is looking like it's naltrexone. So have you ever, me and Molly were actually just having a conversation about this prior, whether like using naltrexone more as like a PRN, you know, if you know there is kind of a potential for a binge episode or kind of that harm reduction approach to be like, okay, well, if we take this medication, we know it can decrease the pleasure that you get when you usually consume these foods. So I was just wondering if you ever used it in that way. And then can you speak a little bit about when clients go off naltrexone, like the dopamine pathway and, and how long it takes to get back to kind of like homeostasis? Yeah. So it certainly is a medication that again, the FDA approval for alcohol use disorder isn't in a PRN fashion. And it only works when you take it. So this is part of why, you know, Vivitrol is such a great option for people who either don't know when the trigger is going to show up right in front of their face or are kind of on the border between contemplation, like maybe I have a problem, maybe I don't. So it can be used in that way. There's no harm in using that in that way. I think the question is, is there benefit in using it? in that way. And that, that I think remains to be seen. And, and also will probably like everything else be patient specific. And then as far as when you come off of naltrexone, when you look at it with other addictions, a lot of times if it's stopped after three months or four months or six months, even for the, in the case of smoking, there've been studies looking at it with comorbid substance use disorder and nicotine use disorder. When you take the medication off, then the risk rises again. And I think when I conceptualize using medication-assisted therapy, it's largely to be another source of support for people while they're getting connected to a recovery community, while they're getting changing the people, places, and things that trigger their cue dependent learning centers that are connected to the reward center that are connected to cravings. So I look at it as a way to sort of give somebody a, a buffer for a period of time that they're going to need to learn emotion management skills and practice things like mindfulness and get into new patterns and develop, really start to hammer in some of the brain circuitry 
that is involved in new behaviors and new habits. Yeah, it's so interesting because we were just talking about, I've had clients over the years with alcohol use disorder use the Sinclair method with the naltrexone where it they were taking it like an hour before they knew that they were going to consume alcohol. And then it just took the pleasure out of that versus when we take it every day, they were, no, you know, I've had clients who take it every day and notice they were just flat all the yeah. time and they had a really hard time tolerating that. And so then they would come off of it and then it was like a whole nother issue to try to support them through what's the next step. And not that I prescribe whatsoever. I just happen to be right. the support person on the other end. So it is really interesting to hear how it works. So and that, what is, I'm one, oh, go ahead. Know, that yeah. can be a challenge with naltrexone because we want people to be responding to natural rewards right? Mm -hmm. Connecting on a deep level with community or going for a walk with family, you know, those sorts of things. And some people cannot tolerate and really feel the block. Yeah. So will you talk to us a little bit about the pros and cons? We, I shouldn't speak for Clarissa, but I know I've lately had a lot of clients come who they want to get on Contrave or some of these newer stimulant-like medications for the binge part of it. But it sounds like you're conceptualizing it as like, we really have to look at, is this binge eating disorder? Is this binge eating disorder with food addiction? And so can you maybe speak to those people who are thinking about that, like some pros and cons of just going to a provider and asking specifically for these medications? And once they get on these medications, it sounds like you work to try to use it as a bridge versus a lifelong thing. But once they get on these medications, do some people have to stay on them forever? Yeah. Or Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's really important to say that when it comes to medication assisted treatment, whether we're talking about substance use disorders or food addiction, conceptually to me as a physician, if it is a medication that is helping a person's chronic disease state stay in a level of arrest, like full arrest, and they're not having side effects from it, that's a medication that I am fully in support of a person staying on for as long as they want to be on it. And oftentimes with that patient population, it's a matter of helping destigmatize being on medications and normalizing that this is a healthy thing for you to be taking because look at what's happening in your life and in your recovery when you're on this medication. So a lot of the time it's helping people understand that medications can be helpful. And if it's something that works, continue taking it. You know, there's no magic 12-month mark or six-month mark or three-year mark that says now you can stop. When it comes to medications like Contrave, for example, you know, I have an example of a patient right now who has moderate alcohol use disorder, not really interested in, actually interested in recovering from that, but terrified about what her life will look like without alcohol. And When I first started treating this woman, she was a teenager and had bulimia. And prior to seeking treatment, had anorexia, binge purge type. So she's had sort of, she has many facets to her eating disorder and she has a current substance use disorder and a nicotine use disorder, right? So one of the few things now that we can actually use for smoking cessation is Wellbutrin or Zyban. Contrave, contrave, you know, like this is a multi-purpose medication. In patients with eating disorders, I generally don't use Wellbutrin because of the appetite suppression and because if they are binging and purging, there is the increased risk for seizure, which also goes up if they're coming on and off of alcohol. So, you know, she's somebody who has an eating disorder plus food addiction plus a substance use disorder. And it's really a weighing and measuring of, okay, like we can try this, you know, we can try Wellbutrin for smoking cessation. And yes, it worked for that. But also what started happening is not even an increase in desire to suppress weight, but an increase in restricting behaviors, which becomes prohibitive of using that for smoking cessation or for binge eating. For that matter, you know, anorexia is not the solution to binge eating disorder or bulimia. And if I'm giving somebody a medication that's promoting anorexia or promoting the idea that you have to lose weight as a primary goal, that's not a medication that's generally useful. You know, it, once people 
you know, if I'm successful in helping a patient treat their eating disorder or their food addiction, their weight will normalize as their eating behaviors normalize. And they don't have to put any extra effort into into weight loss or weight gain for that matter. Yeah, it's, it's so challenging when you have that like intermingling of the two diseases because, of course, your brain lights up when you say, you're going to give me something that suppresses appetite. Yeah, yeah. no, this will treat my food addiction. That'll be fine. But we already know we're, we're using our eating disorder brain when we're having that conversation, right? And yeah. looking to get back to that like unhealthy weight that maybe we were at some point. So it, with it being so complex... If I'm somebody that's listening to this conversation, how do I start this process to talk to like maybe my medical provider about options for this? Like, do you really believe that maybe that's not the right route and they need to talk to their medical professional about getting a referral to someone who knows the information, the really complex information like you? Yeah, I think that's a really important point because... There are weight management doctors who see people with eating disorders and collaborate, you know, either collaborate with somebody who is an expert or has expertise in eating disorders and food addiction, or there are also weight management experts, you know, medical doctors, endocrinologists who have little to no understanding of what an eating disorder is and how weight management can be problematic for someone with an eating disorder. So, and at the end of the day, what I believe that most doctors are in it to help people, but the problem is we don't know what we don't know. So I believe there are lots of people in the eating disorder world that don't know addiction, you know, and don't understand in any meaningful way what addiction is, but think that they do or try to treat people with addiction by putting them in places where they can't access drugs or alcohol. There are people in the food addiction world and in the addiction world that don't know anything about eating disorders. And that's just as dangerous because what happens is as a person seeking care with an active brain that's in addiction and eating disorder, I'm going to go to whoever's going to give me the most medication to suppress my appetite and help me lose weight fast and lose weight. You know, that's my goal. And there are doctors out there, plenty of them who will be delighted to try to help you lose weight. In the meantime, your anxiety goes up, your thoughts get even more entrenched in losing weight, focus on body, focus on size, that sort of consumption of a person that happens with an eating disorder intensifies if you're seeing a doctor who doesn't understand eating disorders or the intersection of eating disorders and food addiction. Yeah, I think it's really important for our listeners to hear that because again, there's just all of a sudden, and I don't know what happened. I don't know where it's coming from or if somehow I'm just attracting more of these folks, but they always want to have these conversations about medications and my thoughts on it. And the role that I play is to be supportive in whatever works for them between them and their medical provider for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's helpful for me too, to be able to say, listen, you need to go ask a lot of questions of these folks. You need to find out, do they understand food addiction? Do they understand eating disorder? And not just have them say, yes, like we need to make sure that they actually know, because this is so much more complex than just writing a script and saying, good luck to you. Yeah. That we need to have a support team on yeah. board. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, I always encourage therapists to contact that doctor, that primary care physician, the endocrinologist, the weight management doctor, and therapists oftentimes are like, it's not my place, you know, but it really, really is because you know a million times more about eating disorders than probably anyone in their clinic, including the nutritionist and including the social worker. Yeah, it's such a great point. And thank you for giving clinicians permission to do that. I think sometimes we need to hear that for sure. I'm never shy, but hey, not, <laughs> not direct. <laughs> not direct. Shy. Uh, yeah, right. So is there ever a time, and again, so, so you don't specialize in weight management, and I don't know that you ever collaborate with those doctors, but is there ever a time when you're working with, oh, you do? Okay. So yeah. is there ever a time then when you're you're working with a client that you do go ahead and recommend, you know, some of these medications or bariatric surgery, even just because of that specific case. Yeah. It's actually been, I would say earlier on in my career, I was full of more like 
all or nothing, like never that, always this. And as I've aged, one of the benefits of aging and and of experience is really today more than ever understanding that each person's path is very unique. And, you know, when I have a patient who has five active medical conditions related to obesity, it's not directly related to obesity or body size or weight, but related to their metabolic condition, bariatric surgery, which I prefer to call it rather than weight loss surgery, because the goal of bariatric surgery is to correct in a more urgent, immediate way, all of those metabolic conditions that are threatening the person's organs. You know, like my patient was losing his eyesight and losing his kidney function. And it's the both and of treating his eating disorder. He also had food addiction and a remote history of substance addiction. But being able to treat him for the nine months ahead of the surgery to a point where he could actually have a much better chance after surgery, it was really a wonderful, wonderful experience to be part of that, to collaborate with the surgeon, to collaborate with the medical doctor. And then also to hold him on the back end of that for the next three to six months in an intensive level of eating disorder care post-surgery has been great. And has he lost weight? Yes, but he's still, his BMI is probably in the 30s, you know, so he's not by any means in anorexia which oftentimes is what happens when people with eating disorders have bariatric surgery. And he's also not back into alcohol use disorder, which can happen because his addiction is being actively treated. Which I think is another really great point to make because I, for one, have had this influx of clients as well, where they're flying down to Mexico. You know, everything's opened up now. So they're flying down to Mexico to get these cheap, right? They can get the the surgeries for much cheaper than they can in the U.S. You know, a lot of times insurance companies don't cover it for whatever reason they're going. And then they come back and they're, you know, six months into it, nine months into it. And all of a sudden now they're drinking all the time, but they know their number one outlet was the food. And so they're calling me and they're like, Molly, but I know that you know how to do all of it. So let's work together kind of thing. And I think that pointing out, listen, the work before you're having this correct, and it's a corrective surgery. It's not right. It's an emergency repair of these things. Like you said, losing limbs, uh, eyesight, and then the follow-up to remember that there needs to be a before, during, and after to that. And it's not just a quick fix. Yeah. And we know, you know, we know addiction is a chronic condition that can be fully remitted with ongoing attention and ongoing care. And to give somebody who has food addiction or an eating disorder that is not, you know, eating disorders can be curable eating disorders can be relapsing and remitting or chronic, right? So up to 50% of patients are going to have the relapsing, remitting, or chronic variety. That 50% can have their chronic illness managed and in full remission. And I think it's important for people to know that. I think so often what people hear with eating disorders, with food addiction, with other addictions is you're going to be sick forever. Like, if you don't have something we can cure, if you're not one of the lucky 50% that has a curable phenotype of this disease, then we don't want you talking at our awareness events. We don't want you affiliated with our recovered groups. And that's, that's really a shame. It's similar. It's very, very similar to how back in the day with breast cancer, in the chemo suites, they'd ring the bells when somebody was cured. Right. And in the meantime, you have the people with metastatic breast cancer who've been going there for three years, four years, five years, you know, not celebrated at all. Why? Thankfully, that's been recognized and that's changed. And I am hopeful that we as an eating disorder field, we as an addiction field can bring more and more and more of that to our work as well. Yeah, that compassion piece is so important too, because I remember early on in my days, I saw, you know, eating disorder professionals and it was presented in a way that like, this is something you're going to have for the rest of your life. So, you know, just, you're going to have to deal with it. And oddly enough, when I went into the food addiction world, someone said to me, we have a solution for this. 
And really there was a solution for the eating disorder as well. It just wasn't presented in that way. And just having that relief that, yeah, for sure, these are diseases we're going to have to live with, but they're manageable and there's things we can do to manage them. And it's not this, you know, diagnosis that is devastating right? Yep. Because there is manageability in these diseases. So I yeah. really appreciate you saying that. Yeah. And full recovery, you know, yeah. like the dialectic is like, yes, you have a chronic disease and you have full recovery. Right. You know, like we could do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I was also interested, we were talking before and you were mentioning how there's not many studies about food addiction and pharmaceuticals. And so of course the barrier being that food addiction is not recognized. So both Molly and I sit on the food addiction Institute and we're a part of the team that put together the proposal for the international classification of diseases. We haven't heard back yet. So awesome. Yeah. But we are wondering, do you think this is something that is going to be recognized? Do you think think the term food addiction is the right term, whether it should be carb, sugar, food use disorder. And do you think this is something that will ever really be accepted by the eating disorder community? So lots of questions there. One, I do believe that food addiction will be put in the books as a clinical, a legitimate clinical entity. And hopefully first with the ICD and then Eventually, I think it will show up in the DSM, maybe the next edition of the DSM 10 years out from now, or at least as a research entity, which was considered in this current DSM-5 under the substance use disorder and addiction-related disorders. I do think food addiction is the appropriate term because it's there are behavioral addictions, pathological gambling, which is just, or compulsive gambling, it's a terrible name. Patholo- you know, when they put the word pathological in a diagnosis, I think that's just, you know, you're losing from the outside. But when I talk about somebody having food addiction, I mean, it's a person whose biology interacts with certain food substances in such a way that the reward pathway has the characteristic and typical aberrations that we see with drug use disorders, alcohol use disorders. I prefer the term addiction over SUDs because they're not really substance use disorders. You know, that makes it, I think that feeds this idea that it's caused by the substance rather than it's a primary brain disease that manifests phenotypically with exposure, certain levels of exposure to a particular substance in a particular individual whose genetic makeup is such that the genes meet the exposure and you have the disease. And I think part of why the eating disorder world has such a hard time with this concept is, one, in part because we can't say the eating disorder world is very black and white and a bit rigid in its thinking as a whole, not anyone specifically, but, you know, it's so complex. Biodiversity and, and our eating and the combinations of foods that can be problematic for one person can be very, very different from another person. You know, many times we see high refined sugar, high white flour, high glycemic index foods. For other people, it's, you know, high fat, high carb, savory foods. You know, and person X might not be triggered by that at all. And when I say trigger, I don't mean their eating disorder thoughts are triggered, right? I mean, there's a biochemical interaction with when that, you know, food combination enters their body, the chemical milieu that results lights up this reward pathway. That's what I mean by triggered. It's very different than a fear food or a diet mentality. I think another reason why it's so it's felt impossible to get eating disorder clinicians on board with the concept is most eating disorder training and much eating disorder treatment, especially at higher levels of care, is focused on restricting anorexia nervosa, right? And even for binge purge anorexia, even for bulimia, even for binge eating disorder, dietary restraint is often a core symptom of having an eating disorder. It's pathological. And what 
people in the eating disorder world, I think, don't understand is that for somebody who has sugar addiction, for example, for that person to abstain, the dirty abstinence word, abstain from a meal plan, not a diet, a meal plan with flexibility and pleasure in it, but to abstain from foods that have high quantities of refined sugar in their eyes is a disease. You know, like that's disease behavior, that's dieting, that's restricting. It's no different for a person with food addiction than a person who has a peanut allergy in restricting their diet and dietary restraint of foods that contain peanuts. You know, but everybody looks at the person with a peanut allergy and says, like, it's really healthy and wonderful that you're not eating peanut butter right now. (laughs) If a person has food addiction, first of all, they're told you're crazy. That doesn't exist. And also, by the way, you're not recovered. You're very, very sick because you're not eating birthday cake. Yes. And you know, what's so interesting is like almost like the flip side of that is that now I work with clients where we really have to explore that sometimes it can start to look like orthorexia on the other side, right? Because they're avoiding foods because that it's not keto or that's not paleo, right? And that they weren't actually trigger foods. So I get, I get where the eating disorder world has, right? Camp has their their fuel. Yeah. Right. But to know, hey guys, if you're listening and you're in the eating disorder world, to know that there are clinicians out there where we're aware where our clients may be restricting because of some food rule they have in their brain versus is this really triggering that biochemical response? Yeah. You know, to have that conversation, is that really true of a sweet potato or are you just avoiding it because you're afraid of weight gain? Because yeah. that's eating disorder thinking, not food addiction recovery or sobriety thinking. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, you put it so well, Molly, you know, and I think this is precisely why it's so important to have people like you out there that are trained in both, you know, and aren't in this siloed either or world that we have in the medical world at large, but also in the addiction world and the eating disorder world. Yeah, you know, people just, who it, can apply a food addiction model in a way that actually supports health mm-hmm. and in a way that is able to identify what an eating disorder looks like, sounds like, is doing to a person. Because just like, you know, most eating disorder professionals won't know addiction when it's staring them in the face, most food addiction people, most addiction professionals are you know, unless somebody's coming in and saying, hey, I have anorexia for me running, you know, five miles every day isn't like, yay, you're so healthy. You know, unless somebody's explicitly saying that to them, which our patients don't, you know, it's shrouded in many layers of secrecy and they don't see it. So to be able to, you know, one of the things that I love about my work in my job is the capacity to cross train clinicians because we, you know, we have clinicians here who are, who are coming from the addiction world and and those who are coming from the eating disorder world. And it's really wonderful to see, you know, both of those open up and people really truly grow into a capacity to be able to, in a much more sophisticated way than where they came from, help patients on an individualized basis. Yeah. And I think the thing that, you know, so first of all, like I just, I have to make a little comment because why wouldn't I, but that I worry about all the coaches that are out there, you know, that are not trained clinically who are addressing people who come to them and say, I have food addiction, I have whatever, and they don't know enough. They don't have enough skill whatever to work on that or to even identify everything you were just saying, you know, there's that piece of it. But I think the other thing that I'm hearing too is, Hey, you guys, if you're out there, you need to get cross-trained. Even if you don't treat it, you at least have to know what it is. You have to be able to identify it or have an inkling of like, Ooh, this is beyond my scope. And I need to be able to refer you out if bottom, you know, like basic bottom line, like go get that cross-training. If even just, you can recognize it and let help your clients get the help that they need the priority help first and foremost. And then if there's still whatever your lane left and they want to come back to you, fine, but you have to be aware. Definitely. Definitely. And I mean, when you, when you also take into consideration just how pervasive eating disorder mentality is in our culture, you know, thin bias, weight stigma, 
overvaluation of weight when it comes to health, overvaluation of health or clean eating, which is, I mean, I despise the word clean in the addiction world and I despise it just as much when it's applied to eating. So, you know, it's just so, it's just pervasive in society. And this is the place that people are going into careers from, you know, and it's very, very pervasive in medicine, you know, so it's oftentimes very challenging. One of the biggest challenges I face is having a patient who has an eating disorder and they go see their, and, you know, it's, it's taken their outpatient therapist, you know, five years to get them to come into PHP or IOP. And they're finally here. And, you know, three, four weeks in when they're starting to make weight restoration progress, they see their primary care doctor who's like, you should not be going to an eating disorder program. You're healthy. You know, <laughs> I don't know why they're telling you you should be there for two more weeks or three more weeks. You should definitely leave. So it's out there. It's, it's intense and it hurts a lot of our patients. Yeah. And I can totally understand the wanting to look out for your patient, right? The do no harm, show up and like the, but then be an advocate and maybe contact that clinic yeah. <laughs> before you just start start making these, you know, generalize, like get out of there. You're not, you know, you're not eating disordered. You're not whatever, like maybe make a phone call, maybe check in. Like you were saying earlier, like yeah. get everybody on board, be a true multidisciplinary approach. You know, this is a complex disease and it's because we have to manage it lifelong in order to be in remission. We probably need different support along the way. Let's communicate about that. So you had talked a little bit about the research around the medication. What we're wondering is, we keep hearing that there's no clinical research documenting withdrawal from the foods. And we've certainly witnessed it in our own clients. Yeah. So other than research in withdrawal, what, you know, first, have you seen it yourself? But then also, what other research do you think is needed for us to continue to like bolster this idea that food addiction is real? It needs to be in the DSM. We need to have care coverage for this. So yes, I've certainly had, I've, you know, over and over and over again, have seen withdrawal from, it's most profound, I think, in people who are experiencing high frequency of binges, three, four or five times a day, every day, and massive quantities of food, you know, so we're not talking about subjective binges, we're talking about grocery bags, whole food. And it's, you know, it's, headache, irritability, intensification of or emergence of suicidal thoughts, dysphoria, lethargy. It's similar to what we see when people are coming off of stimulants or cocaine. Sleep disturbance is another one. So, and there's not much at all out there. And I think it's a hard thing to research because it's homogenous right? And research studies are and need to be, by their very nature, very specific about what gets included and what doesn't. So I think it would be important to have people who actually have food addiction and then to be able to find a cohort of people who have food addiction involving the same types of foods so that you could do a uniform study and look at what happens when you withdraw the food. And I think we are well on our way to getting food addiction recognized as a clinical entity. You know, I think there are some of the barriers are, it's similar to when we thought that cigarettes were just fine. And I know people say, well, that's just conspiracy theory, you know, and, <laughs> but nobody wants to hear that, right? Nobody wants to hear that alcohol kills more people in our country every year than heroin, you know, because in most, or fentanyl, you know, or opioids, because, well, anybody who uses opioids is like really a sick addict. I drink two drinks every day and that's healthy, you know, which research has blown that out of the water, right? There's no amount of alcohol that could be considered, that can be considered a healthy amount on a daily basis. So I think there are lots of barriers to something new being introduced, and especially when it comes to something that is so widely used in our society, you know, and for the vast majority of people used without any issues whatsoever. But for a significant minority of people, it can be problematic. And the problem is none of those people know 
or believe that, you know, until it's deep, deep into the disease. Yeah, I always think about it as like they've been walking around and somebody's been spiking the punch, right? Their whole life. So they're unaware until it gets to the point where they're like, it's out of control. But when yeah. they're in that those early stages, it's hard to see. You just put it on yourself as a moral failing, right? Yeah. And it's the mind fuck of it is you also have out there, like all carbs are bad, like in schools, in grade schools, like my first grader can't bring anything for the snack at school except for a fruit or a vegetable. And I'm like, he loves chips. Like I want to send him with a bag of Doritos, you know, like why can't my kid eat Doritos for snack time? You know, so it's, you have all of this, like, there's nothing wrong with food, you know, like food isn't addictive, not at all. And then you have these other messages where kids are being told implicitly that anything besides fruits or vegetables is going to be bad for you. Don't eat it at school. You know, like you can't eat that at school. So it's, you know, and I think what we're lacking is any amount of like, hey, for some people, these substances can be addictive. That depends on your own risk factors. You know, be aware that, you know, like the little warnings that people have now on cigarette packages, you know, this may cause cancer for some people. We don't really have that on food. We have it on alcohol. We have it on cigarettes. At some point, we'll have it on marijuana and edibles. But that too, you know, like it's totally safe. There's no, you know, used to be like people don't get addicted to marijuana or there's no withdrawal. This is a great example, right? No, there's no such thing as withdrawal from marijuana. Well, we know that's false now. <laughs> yeah, it, we just have to hope that time will show that these warning labels could be beneficial on these foods. And it's not just like everyone's going to get addicted or it's not just like everyone's going to be fine with it. It's like asking yourself personal questions or having those conversations with your kids. How does this make you feel? You know, how does this make you behave? Just kind of talking to them about it rather than restricting. So we were talking to you before when we finished our conversation, just about like dopamine receptor density and community. And we specifically talk to our clients a lot about the spirituality piece, you know, biopsychosocial spiritual disease. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about how you work with individuals around that spirituality piece. Is it important? And what about for those that are not really the 12 step joiners? How do they find a community? Yeah. So I think spirituality at a very fundamental level is about connection and about building community. It's about connecting to yourself. It's about feeling connected to something bigger than the part of your body that is riddled with disease and addiction and eating disorders alike, right? Your brain. And thank God there are bigger and more powerful places that we can live from, right? Until the brain returns to, you know, normalized functioning. So spirituality at a very fundamental level is really just about connecting, you know, and when, if I can be a place of connection for a patient, that in and of itself is the beginning of spirituality. And similar to people's relationships with food, it's very individualized, you know, and very nuanced. It's very different from religion. You know, oftentimes patients will say, I don't believe, like, you know, like, why do you guys talk about higher power here? Like, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. And I say, well, you believe in, you know, you believe in what you're using, right? So if you're using compulsive exercise, if you're using food rules, if you're using compulsive starving, if you're using food, you know, like bags and bags of food to make it through loneliness and happiness and sadness and boredom. You believe that that's going to help you. In the moment, you believe that that's your solution. And in the moment, it is the solution because it takes everything, you know, there's that sense of, for people with food addiction, that sense of relief that comes with using. So I do believe and talk to patients about it in that way. You know, everybody has a higher power. If you want to know what yours is, watch what you do and look at how you're treating yourself. Because some part of you believes that you don't deserve much if you're turning to food where there might be other, and it's hurting you in ways that are hurting you. And there are other ways to get your needs met that you may not be aware of yet, but 
that will be infinitely more rewarding and more life-giving than what you know. You know, so, and I think the other part of spirituality is, you know, most of my patients, all of my patients have had traumatic experiences in their lives. You know, I think that's part and parcel of being a human being, right? Certainly not all of them have post-traumatic stress disorder, but we are affected by our experiences. And the beliefs that stem from coming from a place where there wasn't care and attention or safety or consistent care, attention and safety impact somebody's beliefs about their worth in the world, impact somebody's beliefs about the capacity of another human being to take care of them, or the capacity of the universe to take care of them. And so much of spiritual healing is really about from experiential learning in therapeutic settings, in 12-step communities, in other peer support or therapist-led support groups, is having experiences that fly in the face of, you're not worth anything. You know, you deserve to be deprived, you deserve to be rejected, you deserve to be abandoned, you deserve to be hurt. And that, I think, helps to facilitate a shutting of the lens that people with trauma come into all of their experiences with and enables them to let go of that lens and see a whole new world and experience themselves and other people in whole new ways. Thank you for sharing that for sure. So what's next for your clinic and how do our listeners find you? So I think we're going to try to like rest for a few weeks. <laughs> we just recently opened our residential. This is about two months ago, which has been so rewarding and so wonderful and a lot of work, but I'm thrilled to be able to offer outpatient, intensive outpatient, day treatment, and now residential because we had such a hard time finding specifically for our patients with co-occurring addiction, substance addiction, and eating disorders plus or minus food addiction places to go that could really look at and really in a robust way treat the addiction, treat the eating disorder, treat the food addiction, and treat the trauma. So We've been busy getting that off the ground. And we also recently opened an adolescent intensive outpatient, which it has been something that I've wanted to do since we opened five years ago now, six years ago now. So I think we're going to pause and (laughs) settle in to the growth. And you can find us on the internet, www.suncloudhealth.com. It's spelled just how it sounds. The dialectic is embedded in our name. (laughs) And you can reach me. Email is probably best. And it's drkim at suncloudhealth.com. And it's just D-R-K-I-M. I just couldn't be more excited about another residential program because there is not enough of them and the need is so high. Absolutely. Yeah, demand has been, as I'm sure you guys know, through the roof at all levels of care since you know a year into the pandemic. Absolutely. I'm also wondering before we wrap up, you would specifically probably work with body image issues all on a consistent basis. If there is met like audience out there who is wondering like, who do I actually go to and look at? Is there individuals you respect in the body image field that you share with clients or, you know, ones that you think really have the right kind of messaging that we can direct individuals even that we work with too? Yeah. There are clinicians in the community here that I work with very regularly who, because the body image piece tends to be probably the most distressing for the majority of my patients with eating disorders. And it drives suicidal ideation in a very clear way. So I always am connecting with therapists in the community here who have expertise with body image. The theoretical framework that I use is really around, you know, health at every size with a focus on health. And then also therapists who have some way, shape or form of trauma training, because so much of the body hate is not about the body. It's about the body memories. It's about the energy that was transmitted to the body during abusive situations or during the energy that was never transmitted to the body because there's been physical neglect or emotional neglect. So I would say those are probably the two pieces that I look for when I'm 
treating a patient and working with a therapist and trying to find an eating disorder therapist to help the person is one that they have a body diversity, weight diversity, health at every size focus. And then also that they have some capacity to specifically target trauma in a body specific way. So like some of the somatic therapies that actually used safe touch can be incredibly healing. And when that is done concomitantly with the more standard body image techniques, the results are pretty powerful. Thank you. Yeah. Such a great resource. I'm going to start doing research and find resources for ourselves. I'm glad that you have them in your community. And and I think, yeah, just to be able to reach out and connect with them and, and see if they do any sort of work with folks internationally or anything like that would be, I think, definitely next on my to-do list to find for for our clients. It's hard. It's hard to find people who really specialize in body image because it's something that takes like chipping away at and chipping away at and chipping away at and chipping away at, you know, it's definitely not a quick fix. You know, it's one of the longest lasting, I think, pieces to turn around for people, you know, a year, two years, five years into their recovery. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So your two-part interview is going to air on Christmas Eve. Uh, Merry Christmas to you guys who are listening. I love that. (laughs) So if you could give the listeners some words of wisdom for this holiday season, what would they be? Honor yourself, you know, honor your truth. I do believe that every patient out there has deep down inside their solutions And when you're working with somebody who's interested in, who is more invested in helping you find solutions that are going to work for you inside of you than invested in their theoretical model or their bent or their agenda, you're in good hands. So honor yourself, know that you're enough and that full recovery is possible, whether you have curable disease, chronic disease, relapsing and remitting disease. You're more than all of that and any of that. Oh, Cam, goosebumps. I love it. I know. I know. I could cry. Like, Merry Christmas. <laughs> yes. Yes. Such a, this has been such an honor to be, get to speak with you for two hours now. And just you are a shining light in sometimes a very difficult field sometimes, right? Yeah, and that's why so- I'm so happy to be here with you guys. It's like... <laughs> Can we do it again in a couple of months? Right? Yes. Uh, we would yes, love we it. Can. We would love yes, it. we can. <laughs> yes, we can. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for being who you are and doing what you do. You're unicorns. So in the best way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.